Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the, the, the book of Romans, uh, Paul's letter to the church of Rome, uh, the 12th chapter, beginning at the ninth verse. Listen for God's word for you this morning. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but be ardent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to the stranger. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought to what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends upon you, Live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On this day when we, uh, weekend where we're celebrating uh, Labor Day, it's a day to celebrate the, the role and place of, of work in our life and that uh, God calls us to, to have a, a vibrant sense of understanding of our calling to uh, not just a, a faith that uh, follows Jesus on Sundays and uh, has our time of prayer and worship during the, the week, but uh, that our life is truly lived out with a sense of calling and God's presence in our lives. Uh, when we have that sense, we, we truly understand that, that all of life is a gift to us and we get the, the joy of being able to, to serve through our work, through uh, our leisure, as uh, the call to worship said, uh, in our, and, and in our play, in all those places that uh, we, we live a life that is pleasing and uh, serving to God. I always love the, the story about uh, shaker furniture. And the, the reason, you know, that shaker furniture has such value and has stayed around for such a long period of time is, that, is because when the, those shakers crafted furniture, they believed that in every piece of furniture that they were creating, they were giving glory to God. That whatever they created, whatever they did in their work was a way of expressing glory to God. And so they did it with the highest quality. If you're offering glory to God in your work, why would you ever slough off? Why would you ever do less than your best if it's to bring glory to God? And when we live our life in that way, we, we give witness to our faith. Um, our, our, God, our lesson today comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Uh, much of the New Testament is uh, made up of letters, letters that were sent uh, by Paul, to, by others, uh, to, to church leaders, and uh, to, to give encouragement and direction in the church. Uh, they're they range in all kinds of topics. Uh, listening, reading one of Paul's letters is almost kind of like, you, you know, you ever sit in the, in the house while your uh, spouse or someone else was on the phone talking to somebody, and you know something of the person they're talking to in the context, but... Um, the, the questions that will be raised or the words that are said, uh, you, you, you don't know what's going on on the other side of the conversation. You get to hear half of it. And, uh, and you know some of the context, so it, it gives you more than half the information, but still you could be way off in the assumptions. Um, 
and Angie was talking to our daughter Anna, who, you know, she finished school in her master's degree at uh, University of North Carolina, and now she's moved to Baltimore and uh, applying for jobs and work. And um, one of the things that she's learned is to, uh, in the course of her life, is that she's worked ever since she got out of high school. There's hardly been a time she, she hasn't worked. And so whenever she's applying, sometimes it doesn't go in the process that uh, the timeline you would like. And, and even whenever things are going well in terms of the interview process, it, it doesn't always happen in the moment that you want it to. And so she began uh, work. Um, you know, these, these phones are pretty amazing, all that you can do. And, and there's probably not anybody in Chickasha who does this. But, uh, but in Baltimore, they use an app that's called Rover. I don't know if any of you ever heard of it, but if, if you have a dog and you need care for your dog, someone to walk your dog during the day, through that app you can find them. Well, she signed up to do that, and so she started walking dogs all over Baltimore and feeding dogs and stuff like that while, you know, she's waiting through the interview process. And then, um, so, you know, she's talking about someone who's wanting to uh, have her walk their dog while at the same time she's applied for a position at the Maryland Humanities Council as their associate director and, uh, you know, going through interviews about all that at the same time. And I could easily make the assumption you're talking about the Humanities Council when it's actually much more serious because somebody has to find someone to walk their dog, you know, as I listen to the other side of the, the conversation. The good news is Tuesday she starts as the associate director at the uh, Humanities uh, Council in Maryland. So that's exciting. Uh, but, but I guess the other is just as good, right? You know, it, uh, uh, it's good to work and it's good to, to have vocation in our lives. And, and, and listening to the conversation is kind of like Paul uh, in his letters. Um, we get to hear the conversation that takes place. And from Paul's perspective, answering questions sometimes that we might not know the question, but we get to hear the answer. Um, sometimes giving direction in ways that we don't know the context fully, uh, but we hear the truth that's there. The letters, they come in such a wide range. Some of them, um, uh, Philemon, just one slim chapter, and yet... What could be more important than what is conveyed in the letter of Philemon about reconciliation between, uh, between two people? Uh, some of the letters, when you read, you, 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 know, you, you, you still have questions as you're going through. Uh, Hebrews, Hebrews is so heavy and so dense, and so sometimes it's so full of uh, practices about temple worship that it's really hard for us to understand. Um, of all of Paul's letters, um, the Romans is the most theological of all of them. He expresses a theology about our understanding of who we are in Christ and what Christ does for us to justify our life and how our faith in Him, not what we do or accomplish or our value by any worldly standard sets our perspective, but our, but our true value is understood by what Christ has done for us and our place in Christ. And, and that's what he conveys in this message so fully. Yet, our verse for today is a part of a different section of the letter. He moves from the heavy argument about justification by faith. And as he's moving through the letter, he comes to this part of the letter where he's now giving out very practical advice. Um, there's a, a word for it. It's called the uh, paranesis. And a paranesis is where you make the argument um, through your heavy theological conversation. But then, the, I would say the, the, the technical translation for paranesis is where the rubber hits the road. It, it is it's where you make it practical. And, and so, he's now making practical the implications of our faith in how we live in very simple ways, how we live with one another. Let love be genuine. Let your love come from your heart. Let it be full. Hold fast to what is good. Why would you want to hold fast to anything but what is good? 
love one another with mutual affection. Isn't that the image of church that I think we hold, where we have love for one another, and it is truly that love that binds us to one another. Sometimes um, it's not always the image we practice, but it ought to be the image we hold. It certainly was the image of the early church. They fought with each other. They had feuds. There were many uh, debates. In fact, when you read through the, the, uh, the book of Acts, it will often say in, in Luke's very uh, uh, polite way, and there was no small dissension between the people. No small dissension. They were debating it. But they had love for one another. Let those things be the guide in your life. Do not lag in zeal. Outdo one another in showing honor. Um, what if we had as a practice to try to um, outdo one another? The prize was to the person who could show honor and give glory to other people and let the, sh the light shine on other people more than anyone else? What if we just did, had a competition to outdo one another in showing honor? Well, let me start, because um, I, I, I want to set an example for you, right? Um, you know, yesterday uh, we celebrated the, the life of uh, Sid Cook, and, um, and as we did so, we gathered here for worship. And, and to do that, on a weekend, a holiday weekend, many people were busy doing lots of things. Um, it had been easy for any of us to have found a reason not to, to be here. Um, and yet as Lois and her family, Sid's family, came to, uh, to, to worship and to remember his life and that funeral, there were many ladies who took time out of their day and their schedule to prepare a meal so that that family had a place and a time and food to share in and gather uh, during that day and didn't have to worry about someone fixing dinner. Um, lots of people who, who, who took the time to make that happen. That's a, a generous act of love. It's an act of love and a way of showing honor and, and giving to one another, a way of what's later in this scripture where it says um, to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. Um, you, didn't, you may not know it, but when you fix that casserole to bring for that dinner, it's a way of weeping, of sharing in that grief in that moment. It's, it's sacred work. It's not something we do because... Um, we're obliged, and, and we don't put limits on that. We do it as a heart act of love. Uh, you know, so, so there were lots of ladies who were here doing that. Um, uh, we also had to have a service, right? And so Steve Taylor, our director of television ministries, he came up and he ran the sound system for us entered in the words so we could sing the songs together on the screen, words that are not in any of our hymnals, came and got it all ready so that we would be able to go, so that microphones were on and everything was ready. Uh, took out of his time to, to make that happen. Um, uh, and Jennifer came to sing, and uh, we, you know, we went through a long list. Um, I, not that Jennifer was anything but fabulous or not at the top of the list, but there were folks who, as, as the family wanted to be able to, to come and to sing, who had already made obligations and couldn't be here. Um, and yet, even for Jennifer, there were plans that were already made yesterday, but she changed those in order to make sure she could be here on that occasion. Um, there are needs and places in the ministry of the church where we have the opportunity to step up and to share and, um, and to be there for one another. And people do it all the time this morning, people teaching Sunday school, uh, people who have took out of their time to prepare the lesson, to work on it, to get it ready, uh, did that through the course of the week or last night or got up early this morning to make sure the lesson was ready to teach in Sunday school. Uh, people who, who serve in so many ways and find meaning and value in living out their faith. 
it's an amazing thing to see in the work of the church. And I don't do it nearly enough uh, to show honor to those who do their work and share. And, um, and, and as I see that and I read that scripture and I think about all that happened just yesterday, you know, if we expand it out further and further, it, it becomes, I mean, everybody gets on the list, right? But we want to show honor to those who, um, who give themselves in such a way. There are important lessons for us in life that come from this, where it's not all about the theological conversation about how it is that Christ reconciles us to God, but it's about how we live that out in our day-to-day life. Um, one of the, the joys of Methodist ministry is that um, I've served a, a number of churches in a number of places, and, and it's been uh, amazing to see how God's at work in each place. Even though you know nothing about it before you get there, uh, God's been there at work already, and God continues to be. And one of the places that we served, I, I finally forgave in my heart the district superintendent when he sent us there. Um, but Angie and I, we were serving at, uh, in Moore, uh, New Life Church. We'd been there for four years, and things were really going well. We had a lot of projects going. And four weeks before we moved, the district superintendent called me up at 7.30 in the morning and said, Hey, Scott, when are you going to be at the church today? And I said, Well, when do you want me there? And he said, well, your secretary comes about 9. Why don't we meet about 8.30? I'll see you there. And on that Friday, he informed us that in less than four weeks, we would be moving from there to Pawnee and Skeety. That day, I called and talked to Angie. And then whenever she got home from work, she said, Skeety is not even on the map. <laughs> and... Um, and, but there, there had been a, a real tragedy in the church, and they needed someone who could come and serve and bring healing to that situation, and, um, and, and so we went. And, um, you know, it's, it's really a lot about putting trust and faith in, in the system and in God's leading through that that, that you do. And, and um, the thing I learned while I was there, you know, I, I like to talk about the Skeedy Church because, you know, the, to- the whole town had, had 94 people in it. The whole town, 94 people. And on Sunday mornings, 20 to 25 of them would be gathered in that church for worship. Uh, it was the only church where 25% of town came to my church, you know. <clears throat> and... Um, and so we would be gathered there for, for worship. And one of the things I learned about their history, they didn't use a Methodist hymnal, they didn't use a Baptist hymnal, but their uh, tradition was that, that early in the church's history, they, uh, one week a Baptist pastor would be there to, to give the message, and the next week a Methodist pastor would. And then the next week would be the Baptist pastor, and they rotated. And so the, this church... Um, had people who were members of the Baptist church that worshiped together and members of the Methodist church and worshiped together. And they would have different leadership. And, and in that day, the Methodist movement, and you know, the, the Methodist and the Baptist helped settle America westward. As the, the, as the new towns were being opened up, they would race each other just about to get there. And Methodist and Baptist opening churches in some places side by side and some places together, working together. And in this, this case, the smaller town, it would have been divisive to have had two churches. And so they did one church and they worshiped together. Um, eventually, I don't know why, but they got to a place where they felt the need to make a decision about uh, being one or the other. And it was over Methodism's practice of having open communion that they made the decision to be Methodist. That in the Methodist church, if you're a Baptist or if you're Pentecostal or if you're not even a Christian, but you seek to live in love and charity with your neighbor and to follow Christ, you're, the, the table of communion is open to you to come. And, 
in the Baptist tradition, that's not the case. So you have to be a member of that church in order to take communion. And so whenever the Baptist church took communion, the Methodists were not allowed to participate. So whenever it came time to make a decision, they decided to be Methodist. And, um, but they, you know, still that practice of using a hymnal that was neither one of theirs, they found a third one, a third option, uh, was, was still the practice in how they worshipped. Um, but in that era, many of the churches, uh, because they would have different leadership on Sundays, and those who were preaching didn't always know the people directly and well in terms of, of their day-to-day -day life, uh, many of the churches had what they called an exhorter. And the, it was the exhorter's job to basically say, you know what he said about this? This is what it means for how you live. You know, Richard, this is how it means for what it means for your business. Or John, this is what it means to how you practice, and um, and 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 would bring that to bear in people's lives in very particular ways. It's this sense of exhortation, of bringing it where the rubber meets the road that Paul is writing in this part. He's given us very clear direction for our daily living, for how we live our faith out in our work setting and in our practice of, of life, um, to live in harmony with one another, uh, and to associate with the lowly. Uh, don't ever think you're too good, because uh, as soon as you do, uh, life and the Lord have a way of kind of bringing us back around. Um, one of the things I, I thought, I thought by the time we were at New Life, I thought i I'll never serve a two-charge, two-church uh, appointment. You know, I'm past that now. Well, you know, as soon as you start thinking you're too big for something, um, you know, life comes around to teach you. And, um, and there was great joy that I learned that, in that. But sometimes it was humbling. Um, life can, can be that way. Whenever we understand our place, though, truly as, as, as God's child, and that everyone is a child of God, how could we ever think we're more than someone else? Or how could we ever think that someone is less than us? Uh, I don't know that there's any way we could. Um, we only see people of extreme value as children of God when we live that way. Um, I, it's the thing, my, one of my pet peeves is uh, whenever on the highway the traffic narrows down and you get to where everybody's in one lane and then those two or three so special people <laughs> come flying past you because, because everything in their life is so much more important than anybody else's, right? I mean, you know, where it is they need to go is so much more important than the 50 people who are lined up in their cars waiting their turn, right? Um, Someone who really doesn't know either their value or the value of others. Because there isn't any way you, you do that knowing that in every one of those cars is somebody else who's trying to get to wherever it is they're going. And um, yeah, how is it we find our true depth of meaning in Christ? And then it changes the simple things in our life. Not big, huge debates about theological issues but just the practical integrity of living life simply. Um, when we live in a world that would teach us exactly the opposite. Um, when it says, you know, do not try to exact revenge. Let, let it be up to God. In, in a world where leaders who really don't understand what leadership is will say things like, if you hit me, I will just hit you harder. Um, no Christian faith within that. The integrity is learning that, that life is bigger than that. Life is bigger. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave room for the vengeance of God. Vengeance is mine, he said. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. That's what faith and integrity are about. That's what we're called to live out in our lives when we're able to set aside those kind of agendas and live life fully out of our Christian faith and practice. Um, we allow ourselves to not get too hung up and too bothered 
by all those things. And it's hard. I know it's hard. Um, we carry grudges. We carry burdens in our lives from things we don't even realize until we get into a moment that we, uh, where we're doing it. Um, and this is so petty. I'll share it because it's such a petty thing of me to have felt this way. Um, when I was in high school, or I guess about to start high school, um, in our church youth group, and, and we, we had a youth group that uh, covered several different high school areas. And so um, it was, when you participated in that youth group, you kind of participated in something that was different than uh, your whole high school and your whole life that you've grown up with. When you live in, in a district like ours, um, it's really hard to not, I mean, to, to be, to not be the, a person who's the same as you experience in, in, in school and then in the youth group. Uh, because everybody knows everything about everybody. You spent the whole day in school, you come to the youth group, you, you know all those things about one another. Um, but in this youth group, it was different. And um, there were only a couple of us that went to the same high school. And, um, and there was, one was a, a young lady who was several years older than me. And she was a cheerleader. I was going to start at the high school that year uh, as a freshman. And during that summer, while we were involved in the youth group, we became real close friends. We did a lot of activities and stuff together. And, and then as, as school year was about to start, uh, she pulled me aside and she said, Scott, I know we've you know, been good friends through the summer, but what you need to know is when we get to school, it's, it's different. Um, you know, she was older, she was a cheerleader, I was going to be a freshman. She said, you just need to know it's, it's different uh, there. It, it's kind of like a cake. And, and some people are like the cake, and some people are like the icing on the cake. And, um, and we're not going to be able to hang out together whenever school starts. Uh, you know, I, I remember telling my dad about that, and, and so he always referred to her for the rest of her life or the rest of his life as the icing on the cake. And um, I'd, I'd, I'd forgotten it until one day I came to serve at Wesley United Methodist Church as a senior pastor. And the director of our daycare at the school was the icing of the cake, and I was her boss. And, you know, I, it just it seemed to all come back around. I never expressed it to her, but I did kind of gloat in my heart about uh, uh, how, you know, it, it was not the same roles that she thought we were living in at that, at, you know. And, and those, you know, that's, isn't that petty? I mean, that really is petty. But there are things in our lives that are so hard to let go of, and, um, and, and we, we experience, and, and, but when we allow Christ to transform our life, we allow him to change our memory of life. We allow him to, to make it different and to, to deal with people in a way that's different. Um, I mean, I grew up in South Oklahoma City, and the only people who were tougher than the kids at Capitol Hill were the kids at Southeast High School. You know, I mean, I say that, you know, John will maybe dispute me, but, uh, you know, that, I mean, tough. And you didn't want to give any ground. And, and you know, you wanted to, to immediately step up and defend yourself and your, your place in life. Um, a friend of mine was at a, at a Thunder game this past year, and the people in front of him were being real obnoxious, and, and one of them said something to his mother, and he said, my south side came out, and, uh, and you know, and how he responded to it. Man, it's in there. And, and how we choose to live by another value than one that the world would teach us is the way in which we are to live. We, where we overcome evil... By good. Because if we overcome evil with evil, then we've been turned ourselves. We have to find a way to overcome it with something far bigger, something far more powerful. It might be, um, you know, it, it might find ways to undercut power, but it will always be lived with integrity. That's what we're called to do, what we're called to be in our lives. 
to live with mutual affection, to outdo one another in showing honor, by giving of ourselves to support, to grieve with those who grieve, and to rejoice with those who rejoice. You know, when, when you're not feeling rejoiceful, and, and other people have something good going on in their life, it's hard to, to want to join them in their joy and to be happy for them because you, you're at that place where things are not necessarily happy for you at the moment. But you can find no greater joy than if you can allow yourself to be happy for them and to celebrate with them. To do it with zeal, to be ardent in the Spirit, to allow yourself to, to get over from the malaise into a place of vigor about life, rejoicing and patience and perseverance, to be strong in your character, to be loving in your relationship and wise about your decisions and choices in life. It's what Christ calls us to do. It's what, what Paul is, when he brings it practical, home to bear for the church, he's asking them to do. It's what hopefully we do tomorrow and Tuesday and when Wednesday comes around. We live with such integrity about who we are that we, we just live the Christian faith and Christian value to where we don't even think about it. We don't have to ask, what would Jesus have us do? But we just do it. We live it with love and compassion in our hearts. It's kind of like getting back to the basics in a world that seems that it's gone astray, where they don't even know basic decency. We have to live it out in our character, in our life, and people understand that we're about something more and about something of greater value than what the world knows. Amen.